Welcome, everybody. Today, we are having a conversation with Bernard Carr and Jonathan Alday, two dear friends of the Pari Center. And they will be talking about It's About Time, a conversation on the subject of time. Bernard Carr is Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Astronomy at Queen Mary University of London. His professional area of research is cosmology and astrophysics and includes such topics as early universe, dark matter, and black holes. For his PhD, he studied the first second of the universe working under the supervision of Stephen Hawking. He is currently president of the Scientific and Medical Network. And Jonathan Alday, who was born in Liverpool, did his first degree in natural science at Cambridge and then returned to Liverpool to complete his PhD in elementary particle physics. Uh, professionally, Jonathan worked as a physics teacher for 30 years in a variety of independent day and boarding schools in the UK. He was a head of physics and head of science and latterly an academic deputy head. He retired in 2020 and now runs a consulting company providing training and educational advice for schools. And with that, I will hand it over to both of you. Welcome. Thanks very much, Elena. Bernard, firstly, obviously, thank you so much for giving up your time to have this conversation with us. Um, Can I just say it's a great pleasure, Jonathan, to be, uh, especially to be in some sense back in Parry, yes. um, at least in spirit. Yeah. Maybe well, if, it's not, if it's not too cheeky to just add to Eleanor's introductions, I remember that many years ago, I forget what it was, maybe 40 years ago, I taught you when you were an undergraduate at Cambridge. You did indeed. I have only two clear memories of lectures at came from Cambridge. One was a quantum mechanics lecture when a chap next to me was busy writing, drawing diagrams of elephants in a grid. And I looked at him and said, you know, and he said, well, I thought he said matrix elephant. So he was <laughs> drawing a matrix of elephants. And the other clear memory I have was you explaining why planets are round and asteroids are potato shaped. And I have stolen that unmercifully in every sixth form class I've ever done gravity with. I have done that, but I did attribute it. So, you know, well, Jonathan, you are welcome to steal it any time you want. And it's it's a delight that you are now here teaching me something, I'm sure. Oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far at all. But I do want to take you back in time because I don't know if you ever saw it, but deep back in the mists of time, there was a horizon program on the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, for those that don't know, horizon was a wonderful uh, science documentary series that used to go on in the UK. And it certainly as a youngster inspired me in many circumstances. But on this particular one, at the end of the at the end of the um, program, they asked the, the scientists that had taken part, if they could ask God one question, what would it be? And I thought this is a bit odd for, you know, Horizon to be doing this sort of thing. And there were all sorts of questions by some of the researchers about, you know, the matter density of the universe, what dark energy was, etc. And then they came to someone I think we both know, Carlos Frank. Indeed. And Carlos's question was, is time real? And I kind of sat up and thought, finally, a good question. And I think what he was alluding to is that our perception of time and what physics tells us about time, there's a clash. And so, you know, I'm going to ask you, and maybe the conversation is the answer, is time real? Well, of course, that this distinction between the time of physics and the time of experience is absolutely crucial. And, and it is a mystery. It's been a, a subject of great debate between the physicists and the philosophers, because Really, the, the, the second question is in the domain of philosophy or psychology, if you like, whereas the first question is, is in the domain of physics. And I, I think it's a very important question, one which the physicists are actually rather reluctant to address. But I think it is absolutely crucial because if, if you want to have any reference to consciousness, yep. you have to explain the passage of time. Now, of course, many physicists take the view that consciousness simply isn't part of physics. Yep. Because physics is concerned with the, the third person description of the world and can't address the first person description. But I disagree with that. I, I think there are many reasons for believing that consciousness 
should be a part of some extended physics. I mean, it's not part of physics at the moment, but but I feel it has to be part of any final theory of physics. And in particular, that final theory of physics, therefore, has to accommodate what we describe the, as the passage of time. Because the passage of time, of course, is intrinsic to the experience of consciousness. Yeah. And but, but again, it's important to stress that that is consciousness isn't really part of present physics. But on the other hand, present physics is not complete. We know that we've got relativity theory, which describes the, the macroscopic world. And we know we've got quantum theory, which describes the microscopic world. Now, I will argue, and this may come up in the discussion, that neither of those pictures can actually describe the passage of time. Mm -hmm. However, whatever the final theory of physics is, which all physicists in some sense are looking for, it has to involve a marriage of quantum theory and relativity theory. And I will argue that it's that final theory of physics which will accommodate consciousness and indeed accommodate, if you like, the passage of time, which yep. is such an important feature of consciousness. So I'm hoping we'll come on to that and discuss that in more detail in the second half of the of our discussion. But obviously, in the first part of the discussion, it's important to understand what physicists mean by time, because the point is, physics, by and large, has done a very good job in coming to understand the nature of time, even though I've just argued that it's an incomplete understanding of time. And uh, we understand, I would say, time very well in the context of relativity theory. In the, in the context of quantum theory, its role is a little bit more unclear. I but certainly it, want to explore that with you. Yeah. Explore that. But what's really a problematic is when we come to talk about the role of time in the final theory, if you like, the quant theory of quantum gravity, which, if you yeah. like, is that final theory. So uh, I think I'm glad you raised this point in introduction because it sort of motivates uh, the, the following, you know, the discussion of the second half. But I don't want to give the impression that physics is all wrong. Physics has been triumphant in, in understanding some aspects of time, and that's what we're going to talk about in the in the first part. Yeah, well, I think I think it's important that we put our cards on the table, which is that, and this is what I'm alluding to, and, and that, that you've picked up, which is that if physics doesn't accommodate the passage of time, and if physics doesn't accommodate consciousness, one possibility would just simply be to dismiss those as an illusion. But you and I both agree that that would be wrong that we need to hold to our intuitions, that we have free choice, that the passage of time is not just some subjective illusion. And so therefore physics, because it cannot accommodate those things must in some sense be incomplete. And it's then a question of speculation as to how we might complete it into the future. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 I completely agree with that. And uh, I mean, and th I mean, they're sort of, you could just, I mean, they're two views. One would be to say that, Consciousness and the passage of time is just an illusion. Yeah. You remember, I think this was the philosophy of Daniel Dennett, who who sadly died just recently. That yeah. it, 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 and who may know better now. He who, Maybe he's changed his mind, right. But there's another view which says, no, I, we accept that consciousness and, and the passage of time is real, but it just doesn't have anything to do with physics. Yeah. And to be honest, that would probably be the, the view of most physicists who've thought about it. But the third view is to say that no, consciousness and the passage of time is going to be part of physics, but it's going to be a, this final theory of physics, which goes beyond the current theory. And, and I think both you and I uh, share that second, that third view, the final. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, is, we should stress, though, it isn't necessarily the mainstream view, which is why what we're going to talk about in the second half of our discussion is, is in some sense, speculative. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember very clearly from time to time being asked by my students, sir, why are you interested in physics? And, um, you know, I think they expected me to say something like, well, I really like light bulbs. Uh, and actually what I used to say was, well, perhaps one day I'll be able to understand consciousness. And that, that kind of, you know, brought the conversation to a, a bit of a close. But let, let's go back to classical physics then. Let, let's start just looking at the picture of physics, picture of time in physics, because arguably in classical physics, that's the closest to our 
you know, our intuitions of what time is, and we've drifted away from that as we've developed special relativity and general relativity. W would you agree with that? Well, I, I mean, let's start with Newtonian theory yeah. before we get on to relativity, because there are differences between Newtonian theory and relativity theory. I mean, obviously, in Newtonian theory, uh, the view is that space and time are absolute mm -hmm. in the sense that all observers will agree on their space measurements and on their time measurements. There is an absolute time. Now, and, and so s space and time are, if you like, the arena of, of Newtonian physics, Newtonian dynamics. But even that introduced an interesting problem because Newton not only talked about space and time being absolute, he also had this idea that the laws of, of the universe sort of mechanically predict how it evolves. So that if you if you know the present state of the universe, you can uniquely predict how it will evolve. That's it's it's the mechanistic deterministic picture. And indeed, I think it was Laplace who, who made a statement. Uh, in the 18th century, that mm. if we knew the position of, and, and speed of every atom, we could predict uniquely how mm. the universe would be in the future. And not only that, we could predict uniquely how it must have been in the past. Yeah. yeah. Now, that immediately produces a bit of a paradox, because this is saying, not a paradox, but it's immediately introducing the following mystery. If we uniquely know the future and the past from the present. It means there is nothing special about the present. Mm -hmm. yep. Nothing in physics tells you what is now. Yeah, yeah. That now that problem, of course, is going to reemerge in relativistic physics. But the point is, it was present even in in, in Newtonian's theory, yep. and indeed, it sort of gives rise to a Newtonian version of the block universe because all the block universe says is that the the future and the past of the universe are fixed. Yeah. And, and we normal, just travel along the line observing. Just travel along and, and we just carry on as machines. Mm. We, free will is illusory and, and things like that. And so that's that's the, the paradox that in some sense, right at the beginning, physics seems to be saying that our experience of the passage of time, in other words, our consciousness, more or less, is irrelevant mm. it, it can't it, account it, for the now it can't account for the now and so I, something you said i slightly disagree with because i think you said that um the now in some sense was more part of the newtonian view than the uh -huh. later view. but i would say that pr the problem of the now arises even in the newtonian view yeah, yeah. I, 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 what i kind of meant was that in, in the Newtonian physics, at least we all share a common time. Whereas in special relativity, we've broken away even from even from that. Absolutely. That's right. That's a I, that's a deeper level of, 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 of uh, than I was replying yeah. to. But uh, I, you're, you're absolutely right. But the problem of now, I would say, arises in, in Newtonian theory. Yes. And indeed, I think you could argue that the history of physics is one in which the significance of now, the significance of consciousness, if you like, is right. progressively diminished. Yeah. Yes, I think that's interesting. And, and but, Newton was the first step. But there's but, but there's actually something else I want to explore about classical physics, because there's in a sense, there's two ways of doing it. As you say, if Laplace knows exactly the position and the momenta and the forces acting on all the particles, they can project into the future. But it's projecting kind of incrementally. We look at what happens then and we look at what happens then. But there's also this other approach based on energy, which is the Lagrangian approach, where yeah. you kind of look at the path as a whole and you're looking for the principle of least action and it describes the entire path to you, as it were, the whole of the time. You know, the if you're lobbing in a cricket ball from the outfield, the entire path is described in one go. And in some ways, I don't want to come on to this later, but I do want to come on to this later. That kind of reminds me a little bit of your specious present. The whole thing is encapsulated in the one. And it's interesting to me that that view of Newtonian physics actually turned out to be the one that's most 
easily generalized when you get to quantum physics and that and that development. So there is a Lagrangian aspect to this as well. Well, yes. And, and what's interesting about the Lagrangian approach is it, it does link with quantum theory. And of course, the whole point about quantum theory is that it, it isn't deterministic. Yeah. So really, although the although Newton's picture is deterministic and Einstein's relativistic picture is deterministic, these are the classical views of physics. When we get to quantum theory, we know that the situation is no longer deterministic. And so that's why, in some sense, the uh, quantum theory brings in the first hope that maybe you can bring in consciousness. Yeah. Something we'll go into in further. And and uh, of course, your discussion of Lagrangians is a bit technical, but the Lagrangians and the sum over histories has this natural link with quantum theory, because there's a formulation of quantum theory which does exploit that. Now, all I want to try and say for the benefit of those that don't don't follow the technicalities is the one approach you look at the particle here and you calculate where it's going to be there and you calculate where it's going to be there whereas the other approach is to look at the path as a whole and find the one that fits have, have, just on a side note have you seen the wonderful science fiction film called arrival yes is this the one where the, the, they they're trying to uh decode the, the language yes i yes. have seen that because I don't know whether you might know, but it's actually written, it's actually based on a novella. And the chap that wrote the novella was deliberately trying to describe a species where the language was more Lagrangian than it was incremental. So that, you know, that these, these aliens see the, see the universe as a whole and their language sees it as a whole. And because their language sees it that way, their kind of attention spans time, which again, is coming back to what you're going to discuss later about the specious present. I do think the concept of the specious present the present is relevant, Jonathan, uh, but I'd like to get into that later on. It's a, it will be a bit of a tangent now, but yeah, agree. The, point is, the whole question of whether something is determined or not depends on the specious present in some sense. Mm. If you have a if you have a bigger specious present, there's a determination on a longer time scale. But but so I that's a very relevant point, but it will be rather obscure at this yeah, point. Agreed. So yeah, yeah, agreed. That later. Okay. Well, anyway, well, let's then make the transition to special relativity. What what does that bring to the table as far as time is concerned? Well, of course, we're now going back to 1905. And and the key point about special relativity is that First of all, space and time are no longer absolute. They depend on the observers. Hmm. And, and not only that, space and time are, are merged in, in four-dimensional space-time. So the way we normally think about this, we think of having a, a space-time diagram with the time axis is vertical and the space axis is horizontal. We're not going to use any slides in this conversation, but hopefully we can wave our arms. We can wait. We can hand wave. And so you've got space time. And the point is light rays travel at 45 degrees, which in this diagram is a sort of line at 45 degrees. And observers can move with different velocities, different speeds, in which case their space and time axes are different because the observer himself is always moving along his own time axis and so it's and it's easy to see geometrically that this means you have different space and time measurements mm. now these measurements these differences are tiny for people moving at less than the speed of light so we don't notice them in everyday life but they have been measured and so it's undoubtedly true that space and time measurements do depend upon your speed this is well verified but everybody agrees on the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And so the relationship between the space and time measurements, they're described by what's called the Lorentz transformation. And really, conceptually, that was it was really important because it, it did away with all the normal common sense laws of space and time. Because the key point about having different space and time axes is that you people no longer agree on what is the present yeah in other words the events which which i regard as present are not the same as the events which you regard as present if if you are moving at a velocity relative to me which at the moment you you probably aren't and and so and that is is really conceptually crucial that there is no absolute present however 
in relativity, you do have something which helps. You have what's called the light cone. And the light cone in, in, in this diagram is, is traveling at 45 degrees. It, it extends both to exactly perfect. It extends both to the future like that and to the past like that. And the point is that light rays themselves travel along the light cone, but any physical objects have to move at less than the speed of light. So they have to they have to move within inside the, light. the cone. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we should say, that, sorry to interrupt you, we should say that at the, the two points of the cone, that is the now of the particular observer. Exactly. That is the here now of the particular observer. And you and I, we have different here nows, which we're both putting our fingers up. But but the key point is though that the reason that the future light cone is called absolute future. The inside the past light cone is called absolute past because all observers agree that um, an event here at the tip of the light cone is before or after an event in the future or past light cone. The ambiguity only arises in the region, the, the region sometimes called elsewhere, which is outside the future and past light cone. So I don't know if the audience, audience are finding this a little bit confusing because they've only got our hands to, to go on, but um, hopefully that's reasonably clear. But the point is, this is a fundamentally different perspective from Newton's. Absolute space and absolute time are now being demolished. So our common sense view of the world has been demolished. And reality now is four dimensional rather than three dimensional, because in Newtonian view, reality is three dimensional, a three dimensional space. You do have a clock there, but it's reality is a three dimensional space. But in Newton's theory, sorry, in Einstein's theory, reality is a four dimensional space. And we as, as physical bodies are merely following what are called world lines yeah. in this four dimensional space. So if you take a world line, if you take a slice of it, it looks like a dot and it looks like a moving dot. So I hope that's a, a reasonable uh, description, Jonathan, of, of what special yeah. relativity says. And, and, and in some ways it makes life worse obviously because no longer we, we don't share a common now so we still accept that even in special relativity there is nothing on the world line that identifies a particular now you know the world line describes the the path of 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 our lives but we can't say where we are on it relativity doesn't say there's nothing that says we are right now at you know 25 past five on on on, on a wednesday but not only that, we don't share any commonality of now. That's a very important distinction, Jonathan. So I'm, gla I'm glad you raised that. You're right. I mean, later on, we're going to talk about the fact there is no now for me mm. uh, from a physical description. I mean, there is a point at the intersect of the light cone, but um, th there's no way of describing the motion of that point. Yeah. What you're saying, and quite correctly, is that, that there's a deeper problem in special relativity, is that there is no global now. Yes. There is yeah. no connection between your now and my now if we're not at the same place. Um, but uh, and, and of course, Einstein himself was the person who kept stressing that there is no now, no passage of time. He Einstein said when when um, one of his friends died, he, he wrote to the widow. Yeah. And, and he said the uh, physicists realized that um, the concept of now is just a stubbornly persistent illusion because in physics there is no now even though there is in our experience but, and that, so, but that's putting einstein's cards on the table which are very different from ours because he's accepting the physics picture as being the correct one whereas we would say if special relativity doesn't describe a particular now that shows its limitations uh, absolutely and i mean so in that sense, we're disagreeing with Einstein. We're, well, that might seem rather bold because Einstein was the great genius of, 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 of the 20th century, but he's not around to argue anymore. No, so not around to argue. So we can carry on. But yeah. I mean, but of course, it, but there was always, even in Einstein's time, there was a huge debate uh, between physics and physicists and philosophers about the status of now. And in fact, there was a famous debate between Einstein, the greatest physicist of his time, and Henry Bergson, the greatest philosopher of his time, which took place, I think, in, in uh, 1922, just over 100 years ago. 
right. where basic no 1921 where basically Bergson was defending the now of experience and, and Einstein was saying no it's just an illusion because all Einstein was interested in was was clocks yeah. Clock yeah. Yeah. and 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 ruler measurements and he he regarded experience of time flow as as, mm -hmm. as as well a stubbornly persistent illusion at least not something which was part of physics but we're going to disagree with that later yeah. I, I'm I'm relatively more sanguine about disagreeing with Einstein because he could never come to terms with quantum theory. So that's one one strike against him, in my view. Well, uh, bear in uh, mind, Jonathan, that all great physicists are wrong about some things. I mean, I was lucky to do my PhD with Stephen Hawking, who was uh, he was in his own right. He was a genius uh, and, and a great physicist, but he was wrong about some things. Yeah. And uh, and he made quite a lot of mistakes. And uh, but. In physics, it doesn't matter so much if you're wrong. The question is whether the whether the mistake is useful. Yeah. Um, was, it Pauli, and, uh, was it Pauli that said that's not even wrong? Or was it uh, was it Bohr who said about something that's not even wrong? Yeah, he said it's not even wrong. But that was meant to be dismissal. But I mean, the point is that very often in physics, it's the mistakes which are most useful. Indeed. Uh, for example, uh, Stephen, when he discovered black hole of apparition, he 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 had a famous conclusion which is that what's called the information paradox yep. is getting a little bit technical saying that when you form a black hole all information about what goes into the black hole lost. disappears so when the black hole evaporates as it did according to his theory you've lost the information well that went against the, the tenets of quantum theory for various reasons so it led to a huge argument which went on for 40 years Stephen eventually admitted he was wrong and even in his last years, he was trying to understand why he was wrong. But the point is, um, I, I think it was Wilczek who said, you know, there are some mistakes, uh, which are the mistakes of a genius. You know, some mistakes are so important because they lead to a huge amount of, yeah, yeah. of, of discussion. And I like to think that this discuss that, you know, Einstein saying that there is no passage of now i like to think that's also a, a mistake but the mistake of genius useful mistake has led to uh in this case a hundred years of, of interesting discussion well seeing as we're talking about einstein although obviously he he was the father of special relativity we ought to now go on to talk about general relativity which muddies the waters even further really before doing that do you want to say a little bit about the evidence for special relativity do by all means, yeah. Do do do. I, mean, I I I just wanted to say because some people might think this is all theory, yeah, and yeah. I just want to emphasize that we know special relativity is correct from experiments. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most famous uh, predictions of relativity, as I said, special relativity, is that uh, time runs slower if you if you move at high speed, and we know that is correct. It's it's only it's only important. Uh, if you travel at close to the speed of light, but it's been measured even for people moving much less than the speed of light. And uh, maybe this is too technical, but a simple illustration of this is that you have what are called co cosmic ray muons. And they come into the atmosphere. A muon decays in about a millionth of a second, so it could never reach the ground if you didn't allow for relativity. But because it's moving at very close to the speed of light, that millionth of a second actually corresponds to something like a tenth of a second in its own in, in our frame, which means it can reach the ground where it's detected. So that's a simple way in which you can actually show that yeah. you uh, time does slow down if you're if you're moving very fast. The and very there, are other, there are other tests which have done for where you move, you you have clocks flying on planes yeah. and things like that and you show that the time has slowed down in fact this effect of 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 speed on time is is measured every day in in when when we use the uh satellite navigation yeah, satellite systems yeah, yeah. because the, well actually that brings us on to general relativity as well doesn't it because the idea of the gps satellites is that you know exactly where you are because you're listening to time clocks from various satellites that are in orbit and you're comparing the time clocks from them but it, to make that comparison accurate you've got to account for the speed at which the satellites are moving which is the special relativity but also the height difference absolutely because the height difference well 
I, I know it's it's common to say the height difference in a gravity field changes the the passage of time, but I I I, I like to say that actually the the change in the passage of time due to the height difference is the gravity field because it, it is that that is creating what we perceive to be the effects of gravity. But think, develop I, it. I mean, I think that's all right. But I mean, the point is. Whereas Newton thought of gravity as a force, oh. Einstein thought of gravity as the curvature of, of space-time. Because the point is, remember, as, that, that space and time emerge in a four-dimensional space-time. So you can think of that as like a sheet of paper. Here's a sheet of paper, which is space-time. And the effect of gravity is simply the fact that a mass bends it. It's not going to work out very well in, with Zoom. But space-time is bent by the the mass and it's that bending of space time which induces gravity because you know you had the famous picture where you have a little particle comes in around the central object and because of the bending of space time space time has been curved like it's an elastic sheet then this particle moves around uh in, in an orbit mm. so so the apparent force of gravity is due to the bending of space time the curvature of space time which is a little bit hard to envisage, which is why you reduce it by two dimensions with a piece of paper. But the point is, saying space-time is bent is saying that gravity is distorting space and it's distorting time. So you're right. You can say that you the reason that time is changed, that it is correct to say that time slows down in the gravitational field, and it, but that is simply a manifestation of the fact that the gravitational field is a distortion of space and time. Yeah. Whether yeah. you say it's causing it, it's a somewhat subtle semantic issue. Correct. Yeah. But, 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 but the but point is. Hmm. No, sorry. I, I was just going to say that I think what is what might be interesting for, for for people listening is that when we're talking about what we would call weak gravity fields, which is like the gravity field of the Earth, as distinct from a strong gravity field, which is your metier with black holes when we're talking about weak gravitational fields it's actually the time distortion that that dominates whereas when you're talking about black holes all the exotic effects that you get there are because the space distortion is as strong as the time distortion is in that context is that fair uh you ha yes you have to be a little bit careful because uh s space and time distortions are measured in in, in different ways but I mean, I mean, just to maybe it would be helpful to be a little bit quantitative because you're right on, on the surface of the Earth, the gravitational field um, effect is is weak. So the the slowing down of time is not so, so noticeable, but it does exist. Oh, but but my, point was that, my point was, yes, the slowing down of time is, is not very noticeable, but but any bending of space due to the Earth's field is even less noticeable, is my point. Well, the point is also that time can now be measured more accurately than space. You yeah, know, that was something I didn't realise. Atomic clocks can yeah. measure time to an accuracy of 1 in 10 to the 14 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas measurements of space are, are less precise. And so now time measurements are regarded as more fundamental than space measurements. In other words, it's the definition of time which underlies uh, uh, the, the definition of space in terms of the speed of light. But it might be just interesting just to sort of put things in perspective to see how big this effect is. I mean, for example, um, I always quote this, your head is at a higher point than your feet, unless you, you, you live on your, uh, do a handstand. And so your head is a weaker gravitational field than your feet because it's further away from the center of the earth. So what that means is it means your head ages by more in your lifetime than your feet. And to be more precise, it actually ages more by 300 nanoseconds in, in 80 years. So it's a tiny amount. Uh, for example... But it is why I like to be horizontal as much as possible. Oh, right. That's why we you, you like to sleep to to keep them <laughs> to keep them in in synchrony. Uh, another example, for example, if you live in a, a bungalow down on the ground, um, and you compare yourself to someone who lives at the top of a skyscraper, then you actually 
age less by one microsecond in a year. Yeah. So, but yeah. I, I'm only saying these things to illustrate how tiny the effect is, but nevertheless, it can be measured. And there was the famous Hafel Keating experiment where you fly, you mentioned this, you take a clock and you fly it around the earth. And that's a subtle combination of the speed effect and the height effect, because yeah. when you're up in the plane, you've got a weaker gravitational field. And that confirmed way back in the 60s, it confirmed both of these effects. Mm. So but it's uh, even though these effects are microscopically small, as you say, it's still the reason why that happens. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, in a certain sense, you under gravity, you always move to where time passes most slowly. Yeah. Just yeah. quite a, so, for example, if you are in orbit, um, if you are in orbit, that means you're in free fall. So your experience that, in fact, the la the largest uh, passage of time. Yeah. Right. So we've now got to, I think, um, ad address the matrix elephant in the room, which is quantum theory. Oh, you want to you don't want to talk about black holes first? I'm very happy to talk time about machines. black holes. I'm just slightly conscious of time, but as, oh, as we... oh my goodness, we should be conscious of time, of course, in a discussion. But no, time. say something about black holes. It would be criminal of me to have you. Well, conversation yeah, I just wanted to say, of course, on the Earth, these effects are tiny. Yeah, just illustrated. But the point is, there are situations where they become very large, and and the distortion of time is most dramatic when you actually have a black hole. Um, a black hole is left over when matter collapses and it regions, these are region, the spherical region where the gravitational field is so large that life can, light can never escape. And that's why it's called black. Now, it's the distortion of time, though, which is so dramatic at the surface of a black hole. For example, if you watch, if I'm falling into a black hole, as I go towards the, what's called the event horizon, the edge of the black hole, you see my clock is slowing down. So if I'm waving to you, as I go to the horizon, I, I gradually wave slower and slower. My voice becomes deeper and deeper, etc. And so I freeze on the event horizon in the, from the perspective of an outside observer. But in my own experience, I carry on falling towards the center. And in fact, I probably get killed when I get hit the singularity the in the middle so that's a very dramatic change in and indeed i as i fall into the center i see the whole history of our universe mm -hmm. so that's a very dramatic effect but you can do something less destructive you can just be in orbit around the black hole so i can be in orbit around the black hole and i can i can spend you no know, a year orbiting the black hole and then i i go back out to uh, my friends on earth again and i find that i've gone a million years into the future and so all my friends have died. It's a little bit like what's called the twin paradox, which is produced by moving at high speed. You remember in the twin paradox, you go off at high speed and you come back and you've aged 10 years, your twin has aged 100 years. But this is more dramatic because with a black hole, you can go arbitrarily far into the future. You can easily go a million miles, a million years into the future. You just have to make sure you don't fall into the black hole. And again, talking more about science fiction films, there's the uh, Interstellar yes. science fiction film, which Kip Thorne played a major role as a scientific advisor. And that is the most technically accurate portrayal of a black hole that has been on film. In fact, I don't know if you knew this, but he actually did calculations for uh, ray paths in the orbits and, and of, of black holes. And they use that to code to write computer code for the special effects. But but not only that, they then produced a genuine scientific paper about what accretion disks should look like, these disks of matter which orbit black holes and heat up as they spiral in towards the black hole, what they should look like if you were there observing a black hole. And then lo and behold, we had, what was it, 18 months ago, the first radar visualization of... <laughs> Of an accretion, the, the event, the event it just horizon. looked like what Kip had predicted. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Kip is a friend of mine. I mean, he he was my host when I worked at Caltech with Stephen, and uh, nice. yeah, that's a great movie. And uh, but and actually, it's not just about black holes. It also introduces the whole concept of a time machine, 
Mm. Because um, uh, the, the concept of a time machine does arise in relativity theory, not just in the concept of black holes. If you have a rotating black hole, you, you may have what are called closed time-like loops. But there are also other solutions in relativity theory which allow you to go back in time. I mean, what I've talked about so far um, corresponds to going forward in time. Yep. You know, so you go around a black hole and you turn out a million years in the future, but you can't go back. We're now talking about the concept that you can go back in time. And that's a more exotic concept, but it does arise in relativity. There are solutions which have what we call closed time-like curves where you can go back. And of course, a lot of people don't. Sorry, just, just to interrupt you for a second, just for the benefit of those that might understand that term, correct me if I'm wrong. What that means is if you're traveling along a closed time like curve, as far as you are concerned, you're consistently going into the future. Yes. You end up in the past. Absolutely. So if they look at it this way, we talked earlier about the light cone and how you're always moving in your future light cone. And yeah. that might. In relative, special relativity, that says you can't go into the past. But in general relativity, the light cones can tilt over. So they end up going back to your past. So without violating the local laws of special relativity, you can end up in the past. And there are solutions which are called wormholes, mm -hmm. which allow this. They're, they're, uh, they're not quite the same as black holes because they don't have singularities in the middle, but they do allow this effect. And Kip Thorne and colleagues were the first people who actually wrote about wormholes. And okay. at the time, most a lot of physicists thought that this is crazy, you know, and Kip's, Kip's broke it, gone crazy. But of course, he hadn't gone crazy. And, and, and now we know those solutions are genuine. Now, a lot of people think something will come in to stop it. Stephen Hawking never believed in this. He introduced what's called the chronology protection theorem, which says something stops you going back into the past and killing your grandfather. So this is controversial, but there's no doubt that straightforward general relativity does allow going to the past. You've got to add something to stop it happening. Stop it happening. Yeah, which, which again may be a pointer to the fact that general relativity isn't a complete theory or isn't the final answer. Uh, albeit that it's been proven over the last few decades to be spectacularly successful. Well, that's true. And I mean, it's important to say that because both relativity theory and quantum theory, which we're coming on to, have been vindicated to enormous precision. Mm. I mean, I, I won't go into the details, but, you know, one in 10 to the 12, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So we know they, in their respective domains, the macroscopic and the microscopic domains, they, they're tremendously successful. But well, the problem, the problem is they are conceptually incompatible. Yeah. And and there is a certain domain, which is on the what's called the Planck scale, where that where that inconsistency does become evident. But it's rather hard to probe experimentally. So it's a sort of conceptual rather than experimental contradiction. As which is worse in some ways because we don't have experiment to guide us as to what the right concepts might be. Well, absolutely. But that's why the, the final theory of physics, the theory of quantum gravity, if you like, is very challenging because uh, it, it involves energies which are way beyond what we can currently access. Which, which you know, br obviously brings us on then to, to quantum theory and the fact that time is actually treated in a rather different way in quantum theory. And that might be one of the reasons why it's so hard to align with relativity. Yes, I mean, it's the, the role of time in quantum theory um, is is a little bit unclear and in itself rather uncontroversial. I mean, I would say one of the distinctions, I mean, we know quantum theory is associated with all sorts of anomalies. It, it's associated, of course, with the, the collapse of the wave function. Objects are described by a wave function, which is like a it has to collapse when you make an observation and and it's associated with um you know the so-called um splitting of, of light when it goes through a you know when a light goes yeah, yeah, a, yeah. A, a multiple split. paths happening at the same time but also most importantly to this conversation it's associated with, which is called what are called entanglement mm. the, the fact that objects which are separated seem to be entangled and 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 that is sometimes described as the breakdown of locality, mm. and uh, or, or sometimes called the 
EPR paradox, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, because I, this is why Einstein was very skeptical about quantum theory when it first came out, because there was this experiment which he couldn't understand, which is that in some sense, what entanglement says is that I, I take, say I take a, a, an, an object and it sends out two photons, say one goes in that direction and the other goes in that direction. The point is that if I measure the state of this photon, say it's spin, then this tells you immediately what the spin of the other photon is. It has to be the opposite. Um, well, that sounds all right. But the problem is that in this theory of in quantum theory, the spin of the, this particle has to instantly determine the spin of this particle. No matter how far apart they are. No matter how far apart they are. And that is inconsistent with special relativity, because special relativity says that no influence can travel faster than the speed of light. So if instantaneously these two particles are collapsing to the same state, that is incompatible with special relativity. And that's one reason why Einstein objected to quantum theory. We have, a, we have a slight get out clause, which physicists employ, employ, though, isn't it? Which is we can say that this this mechanism, th there's no way we can signal one another. There's no way we can send a, a message from one to the other by this. And so you can backtrack and say relativity says you can't communicate information at faster than the speed of light. That is quite correct. Nevertheless, you can do experiments which distinguish between um, the the straightforward prediction of quantum theory and, 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 and another version which would say there is an underlying uh, more classical type reality which underlies things. And and this is called the Bell, um, yeah, Bell test. And the fact of the matter is that quantum theory is proved to be correct. So we know, uh, although you can't communicate information, we know there is still this conceptual problem. So one way of saying this is that in relativity, time is fuzzy. We talked about how your time depends upon how fast you move and what the strength of the gravitational field. And indeed, every observer may have a different measurement of time in general relativity. So time is fuzzy. In quantum theory, it's the opposite, because in quantum theory, it's space which is fuzzy. That, that when you talk about non-locality, the, the, yeah. the fact that these two particles are correlated that's a way of saying in some sense you seem to transcend locality yeah so space is fuzzy um on the other hand and this is a little bit more subtle on the other hand time seems to be more absolute because if you have a picture that these two particles are collapsing at the same time you then got to say well what do you mean by the same time because the whole point of relativity theory was that it was supposed to get rid of a simultaneity of surface. But this so-called EPR paradox does require a sort of uh, simultaneous time surface. And therefore, in some sense, quantum theory restores the idea of absolute time. Uh, in some sense, it's whereas Einstein's theory merges space and time, quantum theory in this sense separates them again. Yeah. And so the the way I describe it is uh, is by saying, well, time is fuzzy in special relativity and space is fuzzy in quantum theory. So what we want is a theory where we don't know much about either. Uh, well, what you want is a, is, is a theory where you yeah, try and understand both, <laughs> which marries them together and tries to explain both of them. I mean, I have to say, you have to be a little bit careful, though, because people often say there is no absolute time in special relativity and that's correct yeah however that's in special relativity when you have general relativity you, you can, can have preferred surfaces so for example when we come on to talk about cosmology which we may do there is a preferred um space-like hypersurface which is constant time measured from the big bang i mean we we talk about the big bang occurring 14 billion years ago by which we mean that all observers will, will say it began 14 million years ago. But that's only because we're taking our observers to be, in some sense, co-moving with the expansion of the universe. So yeah. the point I'm making is that general relativity does allow uh, an absolute time again. And, and maybe that's part of the resolution of this uh, paradox of entanglement, that uh, you, you do have a preferred frame, and, and maybe that preferred frame 
as something to do with consciousness. And we, we'll come on to that later because... Maybe, it's... but also it, it only exists because the universe on a whole can be taken to be reasonably uniform. Absolutely. And it's, be it's because of the, the special feature of the universe is that it's what we say is homogeneous. It looks, yeah. it's very smooth. And that's what singles out the particular space-like surface or the preferred time axis, if you like. Because the point is the most general equations of relativity are very complicated. <laughs> there will be no special time and no special space. But the universe is not the most general solution. It's a miracle that the cosmology, that on the largest scales, the universe is amazingly smooth. Mm. And that means it's described by an amazingly simple solution of Einstein's equation. This is called the, 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 the Friedman solution. It was discovered in 1920 uh, by Friedman, yeah, yeah. Uh, just four years after general relativity, that there are these solutions um, which describe the expansion of the universe. It was rediscovered uh, also by Lemaitre, um, a, a, a Belgian priest, in, in about 1930. So basically, uh, you've got the universe on a large scale, not on a small scale, on a large scale, the universe is described by this really simple equation, solution to Einstein's equations. And the point about Einstein's equations of general relativity, for the first time, they enabled you to describe the whole universe. Mm. Up until then, there was no mathematical model described describing a universe. Einstein's equations of general relativity describe the dynamics of the whole universe, but only because it's amazingly smooth. And in fact, his equations predicted the expansion of the universe because uh, he didn't realize it at the time. In fact, uh, because when Einstein had his theory of general relativity in 1915, it was thought that the universe was the galaxy. People didn't yeah, even well, know indeed, yeah. Yeah. That there were extra outside galaxies outside our own but then in 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 the 1920s hubble discovered that were proved there were galaxies outside our own and he discovered the expansion of the universe which is the big bang so but and so einstein real, really had missed the opportunity to predict the expansion of the universe but the point i'm making at the moment is that the the cosmic expansion the cosmological solution gives you a preferred time and so maybe that's what's going to allow uh, you to have a consistent description of the quantum uh, entanglement. But you, you mentioned the collapse of the wave function, which is this idea that um, when you when you describe a system in quantum theory, you, you need to encapsulate all its possible futures in a sense. But that when you take a measurement, one of the possible futures actualizes, and that's what actually happens that's the measurement result that you get indeed now in a sense that's the first time we've seen anything even coming close to what we mean by now because it is a, an absolute division between what happened before and what happened afterwards now at that moment the wave function collapsed absolutely and that's why it is often said that quantum theory for the first time hints that Consciousness may be relevant to the universe because the observer is affecting the outcome. Now, one interpretation of quantum theory, by no means the only one, but one interpretation is that it is actually the consciousness of the observer which is collapsing the wave function. Yep. That's not the only view. I think there's something like seven interpretations of quantum okay. collapse but because it's a great mystery. But at least it is one possibility that it is consciousness which collapses the wave function. And not surprisingly, that's the view I prefer, because when we when we think about I mean, one of the one of the aspects of now, it's not just a question of the passage of now, the passage of time. You've got this idea that at the present moment you can make a decision. Mm -hmm. You can change the future. You can move to the left or you can move, move to the right. And uh, now that doesn't arise in the block universe of, of, of Einstein or even in the block universe of Newton, because in the block universe picture, there is a unique, well-defined future. And you just come across it as time evolves. But we have this common sense view that in fact we can make decisions at now. So you've got different possible futures. This is, I'm referring now to consciousness, that in yeah. some sense, free will may come in and select a future. So, so that's intuitively what we think. 
Now, but of course, people who believe in the block universe can't accept that. They will say, no, there's a, a unique future. And uh, it's it, the fact that you think you've got free will is just an illusion. There never was a left or a right. It's predetermined. However, when you talk about quantum theory, you bring in this possibility that you've got different possible futures. You know, you measure the spin of the electron, it may be up or it may be down, and, and you do have different possibilities. And, and in some sense, it seems to be a random process. It may be a random process affected by consciousness, but certainly you only, it's the process of observation which determines one future or the other. So you're quite right. There is a link between the now of consciousness and the collapse of the wave function. So that's why quantum theory already introduces, if you like, a hint that consciousness is important. So I'm not saying consciousness is irrelevant uh, to, to quantum theory because it gives you a clue that it may be relevant. But I'm just saying it's not the full explanation. I'm saying a it's full gonna, explanation indeed, of yeah. consciousness has to go beyond uh, quantum theory itself. But for those people, there are still people who say, no, consciousness doesn't collapse the wave function. And the future still is determined, so this argument doesn't make sense. But but so I just want to stress there are different views about this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. personally, but I think it, consciousness does collapse the wave function. It always intrigues me when people say that consciousness is an illusion, because I want to ask them the question: Who is it that's having the illusion? Because well, do you not need to be conscious in order to have an illusion of consciousness? Well, but anyway, that that's but. Um, and when you ask who is having the illusion, that's an even more deep question, which we may get onto at the end. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, um, and of course, I didn't appreciate that that was your preferred way of thinking about the wave function collapse, because and someone else we both know, I suspect you far better than me, Dean Radin, has done some very interesting experiments uh, where he's actually tried to demonstrate that consciousness collapses wave functions in a directly experimental way. Absolutely. And those are very important experiments. I mean, I mean, Dean uh, goes further than that. Dean regards entanglement as 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 the basis of a whole range of psychic phenomena, including, uh, you know, telepathy and things yep. like that, because the idea is our brains can be entangled. I mean, it. And it has to be borne in mind, there is now great evidence, you know, the, the evidence for entanglement on small oh, it's scales, it's yeah, yeah. incontroversible. And the only question is, up to what scale does it apply? Now, we have measured entanglement actually over scales of kilometers now. So it's not just associated with atomic systems. Uh, uh, but it, it's natural to say, well, maybe then there's a sort of analog of entanglement, which is going to explain the link between brains. And, and maybe the whole of the planet Earth is in some sense in the mind is, is in some sense entangled. But that's more speculative because we don't have direct evidence for that. It's extrapolating beyond what's been determined by physics. But but those people who believe in psychic phenomena. Might argue that psi is the evidence for entanglement on larger scales. Now, as you know, I'm very open to psychic phenomena. I'm, I, I, I think at least some of them are, are real, but most of my physicists don't accept that. And therefore, most physicists aren't going to uh, aren't going to like the argument that entanglement relates to to psychic phenomena. But but nevertheless, they, they would regard that as a, a, an unjustified extrapolation of the concept of entanglement. But th there's no doubt entanglement is mysterious and, and, and uh, psychic phenomena are mysterious. So there's <laughs> a natural link, attempt to link them. Well, but, but I think there's an important point here, which I want to, to bring you on to, which is that my own view is, like you, open and indeed supportive of the idea of psychic phenomena and indeed mystical experience. And I think all of these are too important clues to be neglected. They, they need to be examined to see if there's anything to them, because if they are, if there is something to them, which we both think there is, then we're seeing some very important clues to the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality and the nature of time, possibly, that if we were to just dismiss and ignore, would be a sad um, curtailing of our thinking. Jonathan, you're absolutely right. And I'm so glad you said that because, I mean, I want, to, I want an extension of physics which accommodates consciousness and mental phenomena. Yeah. But the point is, there are all sorts of different 
mental phenomena. There, there's, if you like, the normal mental phenomena, our everyday experience in the world, our dreams and our memories, but they're also more exotic mental phenomena. There, there are phenomena which, uh, which might be described as psychic. You, I mean, uh, an out of the body experience, a near death experience, seeing a ghost or whatever. Uh, and so those might be. Some people use the word paranormal mental experiences. I don't really like the word paranormal, but that's what some people use. But there are also more mystical experiences, transpersonal mental phenomena. Um, which you might have under the effects of psychedelics or under the effects of meditation or just a spontaneous mystical experience. And I find all of those phenomena fascinating. And whatever our final theory of mind and consciousness is, in my view, it has got to accommodate all three, normal, paranormal, and, and transpersonal experiences. And, um, and of course, there's another of a problem even explaining normal mental experiences. Okay, so, and so, which everybody accepts takes place. But nevertheless, to people who try and explain consciousness just with reference to normal experiences, in my view, they're going to miss the boat because that's not enough. You've got to have a theory which accommodates all forms of, of mental experience. And in fact, I would say you probably get the deepest insights into the nature of consciousness by looking at those rare phenomena Agreed. rather than the common ones. Yep. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important to, to study them. And now, of course, a lot of my physics colleagues don't believe in these experiences or they believe they're outside physics. But that's why I think they'll, they won't have a proper theory of consciousness until they talk about those phenomena. You very kindly sent me a, a paper um, ahead of our conversation. And in that you quoted, I can't remember who it was you quoted, but this idea that um, our consciousness is a bit like a microscope. And in meditation or whatever, we are just the focus of the microscope. So we're looking at different layers of reality, depending on where our particular consciousness is focused at the time. Yes, this this was this was a quote that came from my friend uh, Ed Kelly, and uh, he was uh, commenting on some of the descriptions of the uh, stages of samadhi, which were characterized by Pantanjali, and and he was saying, uh, in fact, I can even quote him: "It's as though the meditator is adjusting the focal length of his mind and encountering systematically different worlds." And in my language, that's to do with the specious present. Well, we haven't got onto the specious present. We have now, because I was about to ask that well, question. Yeah, absolutely. But before getting onto the specious present, John, Jonathan, yep. uh, which, I, uh, which I, I agree. I mean, to me, that's going to be the crucial part of this conversation, which is why we must leave time for it. Let's just finish the discussion of physics okay. by saying a little bit about quantum gravity. Because so far we've talked about quantum theory, but quantum theory, remember, isn't the final theory of physics. Our final theory of physics is going to involve the marriage of relativity and quantum theory, which is sometimes called quantum gravity. And I just want to say a little bit about that, because that's the theory which I've speculated will have something to do with consciousness. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, and, and so, well, of course, there are many different approaches to quantum gravity. And so we don't know the answer, basically, and, and we don't know what the what the real picture is. Otherwise, we would have a theory of everything. But of course, one of the fundamental questions is going to be. What are the nature of space and time in that final theory? Now, there are different views. Some people say, well, in our final theory. Uh, time will turn out to be purely emergent. But mm -hmm. space will be fundamental, but the time will be purely emergent. Other people say, no, it's the opposite. Some people say, no, space is emergent and time will be fundamental. Other people say that both space and time are emergent and, and, and in some sense are, only arise in a macroscopic description of the world. So we don't know exactly, but I mean, that quite a lot of physicists say that space and time themselves um, are not primary. They're our description yeah. of the physical world, but at a fundamental level, space and time will turn out to be 
uh, not illusory exactly, but they're just something which emerge at a quantum goings experience. on. Because you, you have to realize that we're now talking about quantum gravity effects come in on very, very small scales. I mean, they don't come until you get to something like 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 0. 0.00 with 33 O's one. Yeah. Um, or time scales of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So this is why there's, it's so hard to actually experimentally test these things. But the point is, when you get to that scale, we know the concept of space disappears. So it's, it, it, space is no longer a continuum. It's no longer a continuum. It's rather like looking at the ocean from an aeroplane. It looks nice and smooth, but when you get down close, you discover it's full of waves and froth and things like that. So the smoothness of the ocean it's sort of an illusion. It only looks that way from afar. And it's like that with space time. They look nice and smooth when you look from a human scale. But when you get down to the scale of what's called the Planck scale, it's all frothy and uh, and and mysterious. And this is what's sometimes called the space time foam, isn't it? Wheeler called it space time foam. And so and a lot of people, for example, some people, I mean, people will have heard of Donald Hoffman and and he takes the view that in some sense, we're going to fit mind uh, in at the level of physics which goes beyond space and time, because I, they, they, they could well be the, this final theory may in some sense transcend space and time. And maybe that's where you're going to find consciousness. Now, I don't quite agree with Hoffman here, because I take the view that before we get to the stage of no space and time, you, you get to the stage of higher dimensions. And you've heard me talk about this on many occasions, that there are these extra dimensions of space which are predicted in, in certain theories of physics, in string theory and in M theory. And so I take the view that uh, before whatever your final theory is, it's going to accommodate this idea of extra, extra dimensions. Yeah, and before in you my get to the foamy level. Exactly, before you get to the foamy level. So in my picture, these extra dimensions, they provide as a, an arena for mental phenomena. I argue that there is a, most mental phenomena need a space. So, for example, dreams need a space. Out-of-body experiences need a space. Near-death experiences need a space. But it's not ordinary physical space. I take the view that... Uh, it is, however, an extended space, which corresponds to, if you like, a, a higher level of reality. It's just not physical space. And the picture I always like, I, which comes from M theory, I say, well, you, you can think of the physical world as a slice, a four dimensional slice called a brain, B-R-A-N-E, of this higher dimensional bulk. OK, so that's coming out of M theory, respectable and that's physics. That's in interstellar as well, isn't it? Because they travel in interstellar as well. But and then, but then you've got to ask, well, what if if we're confined to the brain of this higher dimensional A &E. space? What else is there? Well, the only other things I experience are, are my are in my mind, my mental spaces, and so I identify this higher dimensional space with with mental experience. The, the contents of consciousness in my model reside in this higher dimensional space. But the point is, it's still space and time. It's just an extended space and time. The extra dimensions, we don't see them for various reasons, but, but never we can't walk into them. We can't walk into them in our, with our physical bodies. Maybe we can with some other form of embodiment, but not with our physical embodiment. So I take the view that the final theory may indeed transcend space and time, but I take the view that before you get there, you go through this intermediate state where you, you're simply aware of extra dimensions. So um, my only disagreement with Donald Hoffman is that I think uh, there may be an ultimate mystical state, if you like, which transcends space and time. But I think our normal or even paranormal mental experiences still involve space and time. I would say I experience them in that way. So it must be true. And that's what I'm trying to fit in with my model. OK, but so point is, sorry, sorry, finish. But, but the point is, all I'm saying is that when we get to the, when we start talking about quantum gravity, we do have to start thinking about concepts that go beyond relativity theory because we are talking about higher dimensions and we're going beyond ordinary quantum theory as well. So uh, I'm just trying to say that when we talk about quantum gravity, we're naturally led into this, this higher dimensional picture. 
that that's the point, isn't it? I just want to dwell on that for just a second, which sure. is that in Einstein's general relativity, what we used to think of as a force of gravity is actually now accommodated by the geometry of this four dimensional world. Indeed. What physicists are trying to do is account for the other forces that we experience as geometries in the similar sort of way. But because the four that we know of is already taken up with dealing with gravity, we need to add in more spaces to enable geometries to happen in those to accommodate the extra the other forces as well. Indeed, Jonathan. And let's be a little bit more explicit um, without getting too technical, I hope, for the audience. I mean, uh, this goes back to the 1920s when two physicists in Kaluza Right. He said, well, we can explain the electromagnetic interaction by saying there's a fifth dimension. So just as Einstein had interpreted gravity in terms of four dimensional space being curved, they said, well, if we add a fifth dimension uh, and if we wrap it up very, very small on, on what's called the Planck length, which I referred to before, then they had a nice description of gravity and electromagnetism. And at that time in the 1920s, they were the only forces we knew about. Mm. And even Einstein liked that idea. But then people got distracted by quantum theory. But then after that, they discovered other forces. They discovered the strong force and the weak force. But then in the 1980s, superstring theory came along and realized that you could describe all of the forces as long as you invoked extra dimensions, which were, again, compactified on the Planck scale. And that was in the 80s. And there were different versions of superstring theory. But in the 1990s, it was realized by Ed Witten that you could merge all these different superstring theories into an 11 dimensional theory um, called M theory. And what this means is you've got four macroscopic dimensions, three of space and one of time. And, and the other dimensions, the other seven dimensions are compactified. But then what happens in brain theory, you remember I referred to the, the brain theory, you take one of these compactified dimensions and you extend it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's how you can be a slice in this expanded dimension. Einstein's relativity theory talks about curvature of space time. And if you like, you can sort of envisage this curvature by embedding this space, this space time in a higher dimensional space. Uh, Relativists don't normally associate this higher dimensional space with a real physical space. It's just a mathematical way of describing the curvature of space. The embedding space. It, the embedding space. But actually, in the approach I'm interested in, the embedding space of relativity is also really? identified with this. So, But that is not the standard view of physics. But I, I, I try and associate the higher dimensions of, of string theory, if you like, with the the embedding space of relativity theory. Ah, right. That bit I hadn't appreciated. Right. Well, I'm, I guess it's very very speculative. <laughs> but I, I just one final one final statement, which is I just want people to appreciate that these extra dimensions haven't kind of been just added on as a speculation. The the approach of physics to try and unify all the forces into one direction, into one interaction, have kind of forced us to follow this line. Yes, that doesn't mean that all physicists believe in these things, but but some of the, you know, some of the the, the brightest brains in physics work on them and the, the people who work on, on M theory. Uh, the problem is that it's a theoretical construction, but there's no experimental test at the moment because the energies required to test it are so high. Uh, you, you have to get up to what's called the Planck energy, which is 10 to the power 19 GeV. At the moment, we're only up to something like 10 TV, which is far, far smaller. So some people say, oh, it's all mathematics. It's not physicists. We'll, physics will never be able to test it. So even within the physics community, there is a, a disagreement about this as to whether this is proper physics. Um, people say, oh, it's, it's really all it's just a mental construct. But the fact of the matter is that's what physics gives us. Is, yeah. Physics description of reality is a mental construct. It's all mathematics now, whether you like it or not, completely remote from common sense. So I do personally think that these higher dimensional theories should be regarded as physics, even though we don't yet have any positive evidence for the extra dimensions. People have looked for them and we haven't directly tested them we might in theory have found them in cern and we haven't done so but uh 
But let's we, not forget, Dirac always said it's more important to have elegant equations than experimental verification. Well, that's right. And these theories are certainly beautiful. I mean, but not all physicists would agree with Dirac about that. I mean, they're more down to earth physicists who will say, I don't care about beauty. I want to be able to measure something in the laboratory. But the point is, you have to wait. I mean, you might have. To, we had to wait 100 years before we could detect gravitational waves. You just have to be patient. And we might have to wait 100 years before we detect the extra dimensions. Well, we just have to hope we're still alive then. Well, let's come let's come back to to to, to brain theory and your uh, extension of it. So we've got this picture of what we the reality that we're in at the moment is a four dimensional section slice through what is actually a five or more dimensions. And, and what you're saying, I think, is that our experience of a mental space is in these higher is in these higher dimensions. That's right. And so now... where does time come in? Exactly. Now, let me try and explain that, because that's really the punchline. Now, I mentioned that relativity theory does not describe the passage of time. Uh, you see, one way of imagining this, imagine we go back to our space time diagram and, and your brain is like a, a world line. Now, this is B-R-A-I-N. Sorry, uh, uh, this is your brain B-R-A-I-N. Sorry about the confusion. Yeah. Now. Your intuitive understanding is that your consciousness is a little bit like a bead going along yes. the wire of your brain. OK, so it, it, as it moves along, the past becomes the future becomes the present becomes the past. The trouble is that motion is not described by relativity theory. That's why there is no now. Now, sorry, no pun intended. The one way to describe that, though, is to invoke an extra dimension which corresponds to mental time, because Einstein is always talking about physical time measured by clocks. But when we talk about consciousness, we're talking about our internal or mental time. Now, one way of approaching this is to say, well, let me just imagine that the mental time is not the same as physical time. It's like an extra dimension. It's like a fifth dimension. Yep. Okay. Now, it gets a bit hard because it wasn't easy to, to imagine four dimensions. But now we've got to imagine our space time with all our world lines. Now let's compress space time to two dimensions. Just okay. for convenience. For convenience. And now let's just imagine that your extra dimension pointing per, you know, perpendicular space time corresponds to the second time. That corresponds to something like that. Exactly. So you've got two different sheets there, which and as mental time goes on, your your it's this extra dimension. So your the structure of your four dimensional space time changes so that, for example, in the lowest space time sheet, you have various possible futures going to the left or the right. But when you get to the next stage in the second time, you make a decision. OK, you choose to go to the left. So you, if you like, solidify the line. But you've then got another decision to make. So mm -hmm. you've still got two possible lines. So then what happens is T2 evolves. You're solidifying these possible future world lines. So in some sense, the past is solid. That's determined. But the yep. future is still a dotted line because you, you, that's still to be determined. So this is corresponds to what some people call the growing block universe. So right, it's right. saying that you've got a block universe in the past, but not in the future. The future is open. Yeah. And in some sense, the boundary, the, the you have to have a preferred spatial hypersurface, which is the, the boundary, if you like, of this uh, growing block universe. But then the question is, so so the idea is that this time, this extra dimension, the fifth dimension corresponds to mental time. Now, in the context of brain cosmology, you remember I talked about the idea that we're living on a brain in this four dimensional bulk. We That's, really ought to have found a better name for it than that, though, wouldn't we? Well, I know, but it's 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 all now already determined. Mentioned, yeah, I can't yeah. go into the, if I could go into the past, I'd change it. But, it can't. but anyway, the point is that you, you you've got this brain and in ordinary, in the simplest picture, the brain is just sitting there. There's yep. also something called brain cosmology. And in brain cosmology, this brain is in some sense moving through the extra dimension. Well, it sounds it, like time. Exactly. Now, in my picture, 
that extra dimension corresponds to mental time. And therefore, the experience of mental of consciousness is being related to this theory of brain cosmology. Now, I'm not saying this is a, a mainstream picture of brain cosmologists, because as far as I'm aware, no one else has tried to make this connection. But to me, it's very interesting because it's linking a, a famous problem in philosophy, the passage of time, with a model of cosmology, brain cosmology. So the motion of the brain through the bulk is being associated with this passage of time, which to me is intriguing. Now, that's only one I time. Sorry, can I just clarify for a second? Because I'm, I'm not sure I've got something completely right here. Of course. You're saying that the, the brain, which A-N-E, this four-dimensional manifold we live in, is embedded in higher dimensions. Yeah. Some of those, I think you're saying, some of those you're using for mental space and one of them you're using for mental time. Is that is that right? Well, the point is, when I when I refer to these higher dimensions, I said there's a higher dimensional space, mm -hmm. but I didn't specify the nature of those extra dimensions. OK, and yep. this and now you might have thought I meant in, in standard M theory, these extra dimensions are normally thought of as being space like. But I'm going to have a model where the extra dimensions are time like all of them. Uh, in fact, they're going to all be time like. But again, okay. I'm. This could be wrong. It's just my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to be clear what you're so saying. In, in my picture, all the dimensions are still compactified, but they're compactified on a different scale. But they're also timelike dimensions. And your so, specious so presence you see, Alex, there on which they're compactified. Yeah. Now, now we're going to get on in our last ten minutes to the concept of specious present, and this will bring everything together. I hope. I should first of all explain what the specious present is. It's, it's yes. a concept which goes back a long way. It was actually introduced by someone called Kelly in 1882. Um, not the Ed Kelly I, I cited previously. He's still alive. But uh, any, and, and then the idea was exploited by William James, for example. But the I'm idea, right. yeah, the, the idea of the specious present is that there is a minimum time of experience, which for humans is about a tenth of a second. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just to do with the resolution time of our of the process in our brain. And I always give the if I do that fast enough. Exactly. It becomes if, a solid circle. Exactly. If you if you move around more than 10 times a second, time becomes space because you see a solid a solid circle. It's the same basis that the old movies where, you know, you've got yeah. the separate um, films at different times. But the time separation is so small between them that it looks like a continuous flow. So the specious present for humans is about a tenth of a second. Now, that specious present, I mean, and that can be studied by, by uh, neuroscientists and has been studied. Now, on some, some circumstances, the specious present can change. It can slow down or speed up. I mean, for example, I, I always give the example, you go to the circus, the trapeze artist, for him, the specious present uh, becomes smaller in the sense that he sees his partner in slow motion. Remember, the, so if the specious present gets smaller, it means the outside time is seems to proceed more slowly. And so uh, that's helpful because you, he's got to catch his friend's hands else the guy will die. On the other hand, if you look at the contortion artist and he holds his his posture for a long time. For him, uh, the specious present expands. So what seems like five minutes to the outside world to him only seems like 10 seconds. So th that's circumstances where you get a modest modification, you know, in, in the specious present. But the more dramatic instances, uh, if you fall off a mountain, for example, which I don't recommend, but if you fall off a mountain, you'll find that maybe time slows down. So you're falling down in slow motion. But uh, so the outside world is much slow, slowed down compared to your in, inner thought processes. On the other hand, if you have a near death experience, you may see your whole life in one moment. Mm. And that corresponds to your specious present expanding. And is this the adjusting the focus of the microscope? Exactly. So when we talked about people under meditative states changing the focus of the microscope, that corresponds in this language to changing the specious present. 
So when you change the specious present, you see the world through a different filter. Now, we always assume that the specious present, you know, very arrogantly, we tend to assume humans are the only consciousness yeah. in the universe and, and the culmination of consciousness and all that. Well, I, I don't see that way at all. To me, there's nothing special about a tenth of a second. I mean, we, we for us, the specious presence is a tenth of a second. I don't see why the specious present couldn't be much longer or much shorter. It's just like the electromagnetic spectrum. We only see things in the in the narrow wavelength of visible light, but we know, in principle, if you had big enough eyes or small enough eyes, you'd see a much over a much wider range of wavelengths. Same with consciousness. We experience with the universe with a specious present, roughly a second, say. I don't see why there can't be consciousness associated with much smaller specious presence, something like maybe computers have a specious presence of a nanosecond. Maybe there are extragalactic civilizations with a consciousness of thousands of years. Now, in that case, we may not, we can't communicate directly because the point is you can't communicate with someone with species present is either much smaller or much larger than your own unless you get into an altered state of consciousness but nevertheless to assume that ours is the only level of consciousness i think is incredibly arrogant so i think animals have a species present which can be different and even on the physical level i think there can be a whole range of different species presence and i don't even see why there can't be like a why there can't be a species present associated with humans why there can't be a specious present associated with the planet Earth? Yeah. yeah. Why there can't be a specious present on a galactic level? Why there can't be a specious present even on the cosmo cosmological level of tens of billions of years? Just want to interject two thoughts here because I find this incredibly helpful. Firstly, is and again, this this takes me back to our conversation earlier about arrival and the notion of these aliens with a, a kind of Lagrangian language. They're dealing in a different specious present to us but also you know when i read read things written or have conversations with people who talk about things like raising the vibration of your consciousness i've always kind of you know that's in a three woo territory for me because i as a physicist as a naive physicist vibration means something very specific to me and i don't see how consciousness vibrates but if you talk about changing the level of your specious present then that's a way for me to map this idea of the vibrations of consciousness into something that is more tractable for me as a physicist. Jonathan, you're absolutely correct because, I mean, just to complete the the, the picture, which I haven't I haven't quite given the final picture of the jigsaw. I I, I argue that there are a, there's a hierarchy of specious presence, but I associate the specious present with you remember i talked about these compactified extra dimensions yeah. well in in my approach there's a hierarchy of these extra dimensions and they're compactified on different scales and the scale corresponds to the specious presence so you have a hierarchy of specious presence you have a hierarchy of states of consciousness associated with a hierarchy of these compactification scales and and that basically is is the picture i'm proposing but you're right that where there's a, a, a specious present, there's a frequency. And so what one is really saying is that there are, you can see the world at different levels of different frequencies. Now, this, of course, is in a sense old hat. This is precisely the sort of old esoteric tradition that, you know, in a, in a mystical state you, or, or a psychic state, you, you become sensitive to a different frequency. Well, in that sense, one, you might say, well, there's nothing new. Uh, but essentially, that's the sort of conclusion I'm coming to, but from from the direction of physics. And I'm relating the, these different frequencies, if you like, to different levels of consciousness. Right. Yeah. And but 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 I say that because originally, I mean, I've been pushing this idea for 40 years or so of, of these higher dimensions, but I always used to assume the higher dimensions were simply space-like dimensions. Yeah. In the last 10 years, I've come to argue that the extra dimensions are actually time-like and associated with the specious present. So, but, so that's, 
this could all be wrong. It's just my model and my own model itself is evolving as I grow older. So I don't know if this will turn out to be a correct feature, but, and it's certainly none of this, my physics friends are going to believe because they don't probably believe in consciousness anyway. But I do think that when we try and describe this whole range of mental phenomena, normal, paranormal, and, and, and mystical, it has to be described in terms of the specious present and a hierarchy of specious presence. And and to me, that's and you see, even the concept of the passage of time. Only makes sense if you have a specious present, because your your specious present, there is no passage of time within the specious present, because within the specious present, there is no distinction between past and future. It's It's kind of like your atom of now. It's the atom of now. Well put. And and the point is that, you know, it's so odd because I, I, I've i talked to so many philosophers about this and they talk about the philosophy of time. And most philosophers of time take the view that the passage of time is an illusion, you, you know, which. But nevertheless, even the great philosophers of time now, they don't seem to talk about the specious present. C.D. Broad did. He was one of my heroes as a philosopher. But, but he died some time ago. Modern philosophers don't even seem to refer to the specious present. But to me, the specious present is, is crucial. I don't see how you can begin to talk about consciousness or about the passage of time without the specious present. And well, indeed, I, this, this relates... To, sorry, Jonathan. No, no, you go. You're more important. You go. I'm not more important at all. I just... We have the well, same... I, all, all I wanted to say was... I th a, I think you're right. And B, if you're not right, then at least it's one of those genius mistakes. Oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, I'm quite happy to accept it may be wrong because, you know, sometimes, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, this is rubbish. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, yes, this is all correct. But but I do, I am convinced that even if it's wrong, it, it, it's useful to useful think about it. wrong. Currently, I think it's right. And I'm very yeah. encouraged by what you said. But I mean, it's it's to me the, the, the and to me the fundamental question which I'll end on, which I think I've talked to you about this before. What is the nature of identity? Mm. Why am I me rather than you, Jonathan? Uh, you see, the question of why I am me is a question of space. The question of now is a question of time, and to me, there's an intimate link between the now, which is at time, and the me, which is in space. Yeah. So the question is, I, I, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Let's just, I'm running out of time, but let's let's imagine that you let's, and I... Let's slow it down. Let's imagine we're in a gravity field. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, time is relative. Yeah. <laughs> so... Much time, doubly so. The question is this. Let's imagine that you and I are born at the same time in the same maternity ward. Our brains light up at the same time. The question is, why am I me and you are you? Okay. Now, the physicists, the 90% the of neuroscientists, and scientists would say, consciousness is generated by the brain. Yeah. Therefore, the question is meaningless. Because the very question, why am I me, presupposes there is something outside the brain, which somehow gets anchored into your brain or my brain. So they would say it's a meaningless question. However, how can it be meaningless? Because it's true. I am me and not you. And, and to me, this simple argument invalidates the concept that consciousness is created by the brain. And I think you have to have a view in which consciousness is filtered through the brain. So you have conscious with a big C, which is filtered through billions of brains to produce consciousness with a little C. Yeah. And 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 I and of course in our when we're fettered to the brain, then of course we only experience consciousness with a little C. But in principle, it seems to me that the mystical literature tells us that you can have an altered state of consciousness where you actually experience the bigger C. Although probably there's a hierarchy of C's. It's not just like there's one little C and big C, which is the cosmic. I, I suspect there's a, a hierarchy of states of consciousness, which we can experience. We can go through this hierarchy, perhaps 
in, in our mystical states. Now, I'm talking as a theoretician because I'm not very mystically evolved, so I've not experienced these states. I've had things like out-of-body experiences, but I've never had a full-blown mystical experience. But I'm just appealing to the mystical literature. And But the point is this. You are not, the question is, why am I me? Because all this presupposes is consciousness with a big C. Consciousness with a big C is fragmented into billions of consciousness with a little C. And the problem is, why am I me? Why am I one of those little C's? And I will only say that the answer to this has to be that there are different levels of time. Because when we say, why am I me and not you? You, you have to say, well, at what level of time are you talking? I mean, at the physical level of time, both you and I are conscious, but it's at the mental level of time, it's different. So I would claim that the question of why I'm me and not you is ultimately related to the fact that you've got higher time dimensions. We are separate in this lower dimensional space, but in the higher dimensional space, we are connected the whole. And, and therefore uh, there can be this one unified consciousness. Now, Jonathan, I'm aware that we've come, we've almost had exactly an hour, but there are hands up. Uh, I, I'm, I, I can go on. Actually for, had, we've, we've actually we, had rather more than an we've hour. We've had, yes, we've had an hour and and thirty eight minutes. So you guys. Have... Oh, sorry, I. But we're, sorry, we are scheduled for ninety minutes. Is that right? Yes, Elena. that's right. Oh, so sorry. we are at the end of our our session today, but I'll let you wrap it up, the two of you together. There is um, one hand. Any... Are we, are we, are we, Olga, well, so, can we ask Olga or not? Okay, let's bring in Olga if she has oh. come in, Olga. Thank you so much. I just uh, thank you so much for this um, very, very deep, deep presentation. I just want to um, clarify and a um, little bit, in a way, simplify um, the notion of time from the practical approach of being of 37 years in the vibrational world of uh, bioenergy. Um, yes. uh, from that approach, uh, we, we, I absolutely, it's absolutely clear that we all function under two sets of laws of nature. One set of law um, of nature uh, belongs to explicate order of David Bohm, where we uh, live, where we world that we are born and die eventually. And another set of uh, um, laws of nature belong to implicate order uh, um, of David Bohm. And um, David Bohm uh, has so much uh, in his uh, ideas uh, to start to apply um, uh, practically uh, his philosophy. Uh, he was saying that um, past um, is not totally gone. And in, in, it's in reality in an inactive state woven into cosmic hologram uh, until we start to think about this past. And we can retrieve this past, um, not even knowing that we're retrieving. Um, we start to think about something uh, and we go into resonance with uh, uh, vibrations, relevant vibrations stored in the cosmic hologram. We amplify them to dramatic level that we can sense them and uh, kind of see them in a form of holograms in our inner mind in a in a brain and it's inevitable that that um, holographic uh, image of the past starts to um, interact with us and everything which is related in our in our thoughts uh, and future is not unknown future is uh, to some degree could be analyzed predictable and even to some degree chosen because because future vibrations uh, about our life is already in a cosmic hologram and um, uh, and we can slip from one uh, scenario to another and this is why why we so um, so important to know about the difference of uh, notion of time in um, this and that world because we it's one world where we live 
and um, uh, it teaches us to control mind, emotions, and uh, and this is it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, very, thank you very much, Olga. I mean, let me just say that, of course, I'm very familiar with David Bohm's ideas, and he's played such a crucial role in this field as a physicist who was also interested in mystical experience. And uh, although in our conversation we didn't have time to talk about it, many of these ideas are implicit in in David Bohm's writing. And I and I would say even the idea of a higher dimensional space is is referred to in in David Bohm's uh, writings. Um, that that the the links with holography is really important. That's very important in terms of physics because there's a lot of emphasis on holography now. But it's also important relevant in terms of experience. Um, one of the psychic phenomena which, of course, we're interested in is precognition. I mean, I didn't talk about it, but to me, one of the motivations for this higher dimensional model of time is as a way of explaining precognitions. Because personally, I, I, I believe that you, you can have precognitions of the future, although in my view, at least, there are potential futures which might be changed. And and that's one of the reasons, because the idea is that you, if you have an expanded species, the normal species present is just a second, a tenth of a second. But if you expand the species present um, in some altered state so that it's a day or a year or something, then by definition, past, present and future coexist. So you can have precognition. So I also resonated with what you said about precognition. I mean, you raised many points um, and there's not time to react to all of them. You, you, I think you referred to um, the idea of energies, higher frequencies in, 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 in uh, for example, biomedicine and biofields and things like this. I'm interested in that. In fact, only tomorrow there is a meeting of the scientific and medical networks um, bio bioenergy uh, group, yes. which is going to discuss this. But. Jonathan, maybe I, you should come in here. I'm talking too much. No, no, I just wanted to add in that that uh, I've certainly had conversations with you where we discussed the notion that memories are not stored in the brain, but the brain actually has a tagging system which allows us to refer to space-time events which exist outside of us. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that that is, in a sense, the holographic field into which we have we have access. That's right. It's it's a key feature of, of of the approach I talked about. That our our imp, our memories are not in our brain. Our experiences are not in our brain. You know, the naive view is that there's an object out there in the physical world, and it somehow through light rays and neuro signals generates something in my head. So inside my head, there is an image of the outside world. In my view, and many other people's views, the the experience is never in the head. So when I'm looking at the distant star, the actual my my experience is essentially space time itself. It's the my experience, even physical experience, yep. is simply the it's part of space time to, to, which I'm to which I'm connected by all the uh, causal physical signals in in four dimensions. That's why the four dimensional description is so fundamental. If you think in terms of the three dimensions of Newton, then you've got you have to say there's a dichotomy between the object in the outside world and the object in my head. But if you think in terms of relativity, perception is a four dimensional process, and my brain and the object are just actually two ends of a four dimensional process. But uh, anyway, I, I don't know. Shut, shut us up, thank or, or, or... <laughs> <laughs> so well, I want to thank you both for this incredible session this incredible conversation and everything that you have given to all of the participants that are here with us today i don't know if you guys have any closing remarks that you would like to to leave us with can i just say that i know somebody still got his hands up and uh, uh that, that that's charles and if there are other people who wanted to ask questions they're always welcome to uh communicate via email to and i'm i don't know if jonathan will make the same yeah, offer absolutely They're welcome to ask questions by emails i guess that we'll get a copy of the chat and yeah. i'll be happy to uh, unfortunately there isn't time to discuss time completely but um out of time with our ex we can essentially have an extended speech as present where we can extend we can answer questions long after this 
particular Zoom. Or, or perhaps even, Eleanor, I don't know if it's possible that you guys could set up a sutra for us. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, I'm Fantastic. not very good with sutras, I have to say, because it takes so long. But but do it. Yes, do it anyway. Right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> John, Jonathan will answer them all. Yeah, Jonathan. Only by referring to you first. <laughs> well, thank you both for your time today. And thank you, everybody, for participating in this event. And we look forward to seeing you soon at one of our next online events.